Good evening, and welcome to a live debate between the candidates for the 111th District of the Kansas House of Representatives on the campus of Fort Hayes State University. Thank you to our host, Tiger Media Network, for streaming this event through the FHSU Student Government Association Facebook page and other media channels. We would also like to take a moment to thank our other sponsors for this event, the Student Government Association, the American Democracy Project, the Department of Political Science, the Hayes Chamber of Commerce, and the Docking Institute of Public Affairs. I am one of your moderators, Wendy Rolletter sook Assistant Professor of Political Science at Fort Hayes State University. I am joined by Isaiah Schindler, a sophomore studying political science at FHSU from Hayes, Kansas. In order to take the necessary safety precautions due to COVID-19, we are streaming this debate without an audience and maintaining a safe distance. We have in the studio our two candidates, the incumbent, Republican Barb Wassinger, and the challenger, Democrat Eber Phelps. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for being here for this debate. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> the format of this debate will be as follows. Each candidate will have a two-minute opening statement. Then we'll move on to questions. We begin with four questions that we have shared with the candidates in advance. Following these questions, we will go through a list of questions crafted by the committee that plans this debate and questions submitted by the audience and community members. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer each question. If the other candidate is named in their response, the other candidate will have an opportunity to make a 45 second rebuttal. We will alternate who answers first as we go through the questions. We encourage questions from the audience. Please submit your question in the comments section of this live stream. We will get to as many questions from the audience as possible and as time allows. Each candidate will have a two minute closing statement. Of course, we encourage and appreciate civility and a healthy, robust debate. Representative Wassinger, we will begin with your opening statement. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for having this and thank you for to Fort Hayes State University, it's done a wonderful job. So I appreciate being here. These first two years of being in the legislature is not anything like I'd ever expected, especially year two with COVID, uh, obviously making a big impact on the legislative year. The first year that I was in office, I helped get together elected officials within Hayes and Ellis County, uh, Congressman Roger Marshall, Senator Moran's office, and uh, the Department of Transportation and, and the Secretary of Commerce were there. And I got the, the ball rolling on the Northwest Business Corridor, which ended up netting Ellis County a, a huge win of, of $7.8 million to help make a road that's so dangerous uh, make it better. And it's always, that area has always been used as a, uh, as a different route for large and heavy loads. So that was a huge win my first year. And the second year, we obviously were cut short, but I am looking forward to spending two more years taking care of Ellis County and always fighting for the people that I represent. My voting record's been consistent. My promises have been the, the same to my constituents. I voted for life for teachers and students, tax relief for all citizens in Kansas, well, big companies as well as small. So thank you, I'm glad to be here. Mr. Phelps, you have two minutes for your opening statement. Well, good evening everybody and uh, once again, thank you to Fort A. State University and the, especially the Student Government Association and Tiger Media for you know, sponsoring this program and giving our uh, voters out there an opportunity to see uh, what we both support or do not support or what our differences might be. I would uh, point out that um, I've been a lifelong resident of the city of Hayes. I'm a Fort Hayes State graduate, which uh, for me, Fort Hayes State University is very near and dear to me, as well as the community. Uh, Fort Hayes is part of the education industry that makes uh, them part of the uh, education industry here. That's the largest employer uh, in the city of Hayes, and, and for that uh, for that matter, uh, all of Western Kansas. So it is, to me, very important that we always maintain our education funding at the levels that uh, need to be. 
So I have uh, served in this community as a city commissioner. I've served at the county level with the Ellis County Extension Service, and I've also served for a number of years in the Kansas legislature. So I, uh, I served in the legislature until 2018 and then uh, finished out an uh, unexpired term in city government, uh, which ended back in January, I believe. But uh, in the meantime, I've, I followed the legislative session and really didn't like what was going on. So I decided to return to the legislature because, as I mentioned before, education at all levels is very important, not only to the city of Hayes, but to the region. And I wanted to make sure that we had the strong support for education that we've enjoyed over the years uh, as far as supporting Fort A. State University, our K-12 system, not to mention our uh, technical, career technical education program here, which is very successful and uh, very important to this community. So I wanted to uh, continue those efforts. Also, a very important issue that has uh, come about uh, probably the last seven years is the Medicaid expansion. Our uh, state has passed Mr. up. Mr. Phelps, uh, your time is up. All righty. So we will now begin with the four questions shared with the candidates in advance. Mr. Phelps, the first question goes to you. You have 90 seconds. The issue of higher education is important to your district, and higher education is also facing significant challenges due to COVID-19. What role should the Kansas legislature have in meeting those challenges, and more broadly, improving public higher education in the state? Well, the first thing that we need to look at when the legislature convenes uh, in January is I think a lot of people are going to have on their mind right away to make cuts. And for me, uh, cutting higher education as well as K-12 education is not the route that we need to go. That in itself is big time in uh, economic de development for our, for our city as well as our region. We have a situation here uh, where our higher ed is really challenged because of the COVID-19 uh, issue that's uh, plagued our country. Uh, right now, there's a statistic out there that uh, right now 35.5% of high school students, high school graduates, did not choose to attend any secondary education program whatsoever. Now, a lot of that came about because of the delay with starting you know, schools, not only the uh, K-12 system, but also at higher ed. So we have students out there. But what we need for you know, our economic development in this state is to continue to work towards having an educated workforce. And so funding of the Regents Institution is, uh, is imperative that we do that. Now, the Regents saw about a 3.5% drop in enrollment. Uh, community college saw about 5.5%. And uh, career, technical ed career technical education took about an 8.9% hit. I believe. And so the fact of the matter is, uh, that is where we need to put our money, and we can look at cuts in other areas. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. All right, Representative Wassinger. I've been a huge advocate of Fort Hayes State University from the very beginning. I'm on the higher education budget. And it was fascinating for me to see how they expanded higher education to include uh, the technical schools, as well as uh, they continue to fund uh, some of the private schools that have a lot of students that need to have the same amount of funding that the public school kids do. I have always supported Fort Hayes, and I'm on the record for wanting to give Fort Hayes more money because when all the schools come in front of you, they all promise to not raise tuition. Fort Hayes State said they would not, and they did not. They've always done what they said they were going to do, and they do it well. Um, the, you know, the, the budget for the state is over 65% is spent on education. So it's, we are already in that, giving them money, and, and anticipating cuts in education or anywhere else is foolish when we don't even know where we're going to end up come the, in January. So I think the biggest thing that we need to realize is that we do need to support our teachers and our students and make sure that they get, the, the classrooms get the money and the teachers get the money and we're not spending it all on administration. 
The next question, can you assess or evaluate the efficacy of the state shutdown? Did it work? And what were the consequences? Representative Wassinger, we'll start with you. You have 90 seconds. Okay. You know, in hi hindsight is 2020, obviously. Uh, at first, everyone was so frightened, and it just seemed like everything needed to just take a pause. However, I think Kansas is so much like the United States, very rural and very urban in different areas. And I think the blanket approach was wrong, particularly when the lockdown started and they shut down everything in the state on the 30th of March, Ellis County had zero cases. In fact, there were over 90 counties that had no cases of COVID. Uh, they didn't get our first confirmed case until the 10th of April. And then when we exited on May 3rd, the, the shutdown, there were 10 cases. We need to just be able to deal with each community and local control. Local, local control is so important for all of our communities. They know best, the county commissions, the city commissions, they know what's best for their, their communities. And I think it was, it was wrong to shut down all of these businesses and pick winners and losers in, in this shutdown. The economic damage is, is considerable and we never should have had everyone be the, exactly the same. Thank you, Representative Wassinger. Mr. Phelps? Well, therein lies the problem. Uh, this is a health issue. The COVID-19, when it first, uh, you know, hit the headlines, is a, you know, came out as a, as a health issue, a threat to our safety all across this country. So steps were taken. But in the meantime, some people looked at it as a political issue or an economic issue. The fact of the matter is, when you did the shutdown at the very beginning, things worked. We didn't have any cases, but we had county governments all over the state decided to look at it as a political issue, and they pushed back on the governor. The governor took the advice of medical science. She took the advice of Dr. Fauci. She took the advice of Lee Norman in Topeka and made the decision to keep our people safe. Now, we had county governments all over the place saying, no, we're not going to wear a mask. To this day, they are saying that wearing a mask is more important than the, the vaccine that's forthcoming. And we don't even know when that's gonna be. So I think when the governor shut down things, that was the right thing to do. It had an effect, we were flattening the curve. It was the opening up too soon, which we've seen all over the country, Florida, Texas, Arizona. Now we have surging. In Ellis County, if you look on the KDH website, today we jumped over uh, 11, 1,112 total cases so far. That could have been zero if we would have done the right thing and our county commission would have followed through, followed the governor, but there was all that pushback. So something had to be done very, at the very beginning to do the planning of who shut down and who went, would have taken forever and the cases would have Mr. just Phelps, really surmounted. Mr. Phelps, your time's up. Next question. So much of what affects agriculture happens on a federal level, but what are some creative ways that the state legislature might think about agricultural policy to help farmers. Mr. Phelps. Part of that uh, support of, it, of agriculture in our state is, uh, as you mentioned, um, a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, the commodities pricing, you know, by the federal government. What's really hurt our state is all the tariffs and the little skirmishes we've had with other countries that buy our products, such as China. So in the meantime, what can we do locally? I've pointed out many times over the years that one of the greatest things we can do is help the farmers in western Kansas and all over Kansas uh, improve their crop production. That's done right here locally at the at Kansas State University Ag Research Center, which is part of the higher education program. So we've got to continue funding it at a level so that they continue, continue doing their uh, research. We have uh, farmers getting 75 bushels of wheat per acre whereas 30, 40 years ago, 25 bushels an acre was considered successful. That's all the result of the research and development done right here, not to mention all the work that's been done on uh, embryo transplants in cattle, in cattle that was done by John Brethauer. So we have an opportunity to do that. There are other areas, transportation, so farmers can get their product to market locally, and so we need to you know, stay strong with our transportation program and make sure those roads are safe marked safely, and uh, a maintenance program is set up so that we keep them in the top condition. Representative Wassinger. 
great, but the, what we're facing right now is a serious mental health problem with our, our farmers. We have a rise in suicides. We need to be able to put more money towards mental health services for these farmers who are suffering from lower uh, commodity prices, problems with weather. Uh, they, are, they are fighting uh, to stay alive. And these small farms, we need to take care of them. Lower the taxes on the farmers. Continue programs like Kansas Farm Bureau. They did a health plan, which we, we uh, voted into um, allow them to do, where they could offer their, their people, their members, health programs that were cost effective and that they could, they could get into and, and take care of themselves. So I think it's important that we look at their mental health first and foremost, and give them the support that they need. And I'm glad that we've extended health plans for different organizations. Next question, what are some ways government can promote small business? And we'll start with you, Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, Kansas is one or two in the amount of regulations that they require for people to get working certificates. Veterinary tech, uh, doctors, now the doctors and the nurses have a little bit better um, program because they've, they've instituted some. I worked very hard with my, my uh, colleague, Chris Croft from Kansas City, who is a, is a former colonel in the Army. He, his wife could not get a job in Kansas without going through and retaking all of the, the certification for her job that she had already passed in two different states. We need to be able to lower those restrictions on, on certification. That will really help small businesses get the, the educated and, and talented workforce that they need. Less regulations. The, regu the more regulations we put on people, the less they're e able to produce. So small businesses need to get, get that new loosened uh, around their necks. So regulation, certification rules and overhaul. And, you know, I hear this in all the doors that I've knocked. I've walked on 6,239 so far, and I still have a month to go. So we just need to take care of our small businesses and not strangle them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Phelps, the same question to you. What are some ways government can promote small business? You have 90 seconds. Well, I believe what's uh, happened with the COVID-19 is uh, it's, you know, presented a lot of problems during the shutdowns and so forth. And it's also moving forward, uh, presenting a whole uh, list of problems. So I think right now this is a great opportunity, if you will, to re reset the clock. And I think we need to go back for one thing and look at the tax code. Uh, small businesses and middle class people are paying uh, an unfair amount of taxes compared to corporate businesses. So when we look back at the, uh, during the Brownback administration, there was a kind of a loophole for uh, LLCs to get a significant tax break. That loophole was eliminated and so we still need to take a step further and review that uh, tax code. And I think we have the opportunity to do that now because we're going to have to do that in a lot of areas of state government, go back and review how things are done. As I mentioned before, with education, it affects everything. It's, uh, it's part of our economic development. Uh, these small businesses need a trained workforce. It's often been said that the uh, best economic development is a well-trained workforce. We have a uh, workforce development program in the state of Kansas, and we have incentives for people relocating and so forth. And so I think uh, we can't, you know, drop any level of funding on education because that's economic development for every community, and it also trains those people to go into our workforce. All righty. It appears that COVID-19 will be here well into next year. With the legislative session kicking off in January, what are your top priorities in addressing COVID-19? Mr. Phelps, we'll start with you. I will start, uh, answer that by saying we need to listen to science, listen to, listen to medical science and go by their recommendations, whether it's to shut down again or uh, continue enforcement of uh, wearing masks and social distancing. Those are the people that are studying this. Those are the people that know what's happening. You don't need to listen to a, 
a county commissioner or the guy down the street or the bartender that you frequent or something like that, but listen to actual people that work on this for a living and are you know professionals at it. So as we go into the legislative session, I think the governor is going to be following uh, the advice by not only Dr. Fauci and the uh, uh, Center for Disease uh, Control, as well as uh, Dr. Lee Norman. And I think we need to listen to those people so we don't make another mistake. They are all warning us that we've got to continue wearing masks, we've got to continue uh, practicing social distancing. Legislators can lead by example on that. And uh, as we see some other things come up uh, that are really a threat, one of the things that all these scientists are worried about is when the weather turns cold and everybody goes inside. They feel there's going to be a resurgence. And as I mentioned, we're already seeing that here in Hayes. Now, that's, we saw the students come back from all over the country, all over the state. And so I think that uh, when we get in the legislative session, we need to pay attention and treat it as a medical issue. Representative Wassinger. The first two weeks I got back from Topeka, I, I quarantined in my, in my uh, apartment above my garage. And those two weeks were the busiest time that I think I ever had as a legislator. And I realized that I was on the phone all day long, either on the phone, emailing people, helping people get unemployment, straightening out what's, what was going on, helping people figure out if they were essential or not. It was such a hard decision there. I, I don't understand how you got winners and losers. There were no clusters at Lowe's or Home Depot or Dillon's or Walmart, but now suddenly, you know, that's okay them, for them to be open, but we couldn't have businesses open down in downtown Hayes, which had maybe three or four people at a time. I think we need to use some common sense and not destroy our, our state economy in the process. We need to understand what we've done right and how we can improve, but we can't shut down the state again. We just can't do it. The state will not be able to survive. So I think respecting one another and figuring out what the best way to, to complete this is the right way to go. Thank you. The next question is, how do we attract employers to rural Western Kansas? And it goes to Representative Wassinger first. You have 90 seconds. Uh, we, we support the economic development officers throughout the state. We've had, we have some amazing people working. Here in Ellis County, we have Doug Williams, who's doing the very best he can to try to figure out how to bring people in, making... Uh, getting a fund to help people build houses, fix houses in Hayes. But, you know, the biggest thing we can do throughout the state is to make sure that we have broadband everywhere. And that will bring these businesses into Ellis County and, and into Hayes. If you see, so many people are leaving the larger cities and they're coming back to rural America and they're seeing, because they can work remotely, how wonderful it is to be here, how much... This, the quality of life, how big the quality of life is here. So I think broadband and, and those things will make, make businesses come to, to uh, rural Kansas. Thank you. And Mr. Phelps, the same question for you. How do we attract employers to rural western Kansas? There was a, a lot of focus on uh, rural communities here a few years ago, especially as we saw the continuing decline in uh, population uh, in northwest Kansas as well as what we refer to as the aging growing population uh, that we see all over our western part of our state. So as far as the small businesses go, a few years ago in the legislature when I was serving, uh, one of the things that was developed was what they called the Rural Opportunity Zones, uh, kind of affectionately referred to as RASs. And those were set up to incentivize employers to move to rural Kansas and set up their businesses and so forth. So I think one of the, um, I guess you could say, uh, the uh, positive things that's come, coming out of COVID, there may be more employers willing to do that where they can move uh, to an area that's got a lower cost of living for their employees and also take uh, advantage of those incentives that are being offered. In the meantime, with our medical community, we have a program that forgives the uh, 
education costs of a doctor if they relocate in uh, rural areas with the stipulation that they, you know, serve there for several years. There's a, a specific number of years. I can't remember exactly what it is. What they found is a lot of doctors do that and they end up staying in those communities. And whether you like it or not, or recognize it or not, a, uh, a physician is a small business. Uh, a doctor moving into the community hires staff and uh, you know pays them and they're all part of that community. So we need to keep that incentivizing going. Alrighty, next question. What role does state government have in improving affordability of housing? Mr. Phelps? I'd ask you to repeat that question, please. Yes, of course. What role does state government have in improving affordability of housing? And the question goes to you first. In affordability of housing? Well, one thing that I think is going to happen, and I'm going to be very supportive of it uh, if I return to Topeka, and that is a whole redevelopment of our uh, Department of Commerce. And, of course, within that, uh, within that uh, realm, you're going to have you know, some housing issues. So we've got incentives out there uh, for people that are willing to come in, investors that are willing to come in and uh, you know, develop affordable housing. We've seen a very uh, big success story here in Hayes with the uh, Stone Post Estates uh, down in the south end of town. And those are uh, very uh, high quality living uh, you know, homes down there, or apartments I should say. And so I think there's a lot of that uh, available to go all around the state. And so whatever states, the state of Kansas can do to uh, keep that uh, incentivizing going for those investors that want to do that, uh, that is something that I think is going to come out of the Department of Commerce. And I would be a big supporter of that because one of the things, especially in rural areas, uh, in trying to attract teachers, employers, and people to come back and relocate is housing. And it's an issue not only in rural Kansas, but it's also an issue in, in urban areas. And so to meet that demand, uh, people that are willing to step forward and provide that investment, we need to back them 100%. Representative Wassinger. Well, I think I already mentioned that here in uh, Ellis County, we already have a program to, to build and take care of affordable housing. There are so many different uh, things that the state has tried to do. For example, the bankers and credit unions tried to get a bill passed that would use idle funds of the state in order to put out loans for people to do these things, to invest small businesses, to invest in their business and get things done. And it was, it was vetoed and voted down by the, the uh, Democratic Party and the governor. These are the kind of things, different ideas, different, uh, it, was, it was so fascinating to see the, the bankers come up with such a great idea. And, and to have it turned down was difficult to watch. So we can help by using these uh, idle funds and doing things like that within the, the different counties. There's a lot that's being done right now. All right. The next question is, how does transportation, infrastructure, renewable energy sources, and water conservation impact agriculture? And we'll start with you, Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. All of it impacts agriculture. Water, of course. Um, that's, uh, no one knows more about water than uh, the people out here in Hayes, which have been really good at conserving water. Transportation is so critical. We, if you can't get your trucks to your field or you can't get your product, your commodity to sale, you're not gonna be able to be successful. So I think the most important thing that we've started to do is to stop taking funds from the transportation department, which is an easy, really uh, sweet thing to pick from because it's a large amount of money, but each transportation project is millions of dollars. So I think we need to make sure that we don't take from transportation. We continue to encourage conservation and, and take care of our, our farmers and all of, all of Kansas. Thank you. Mr. Phelps, the same question for you. How does transportation, infrastructure, renewable energy sources, and water conservation impact agriculture? Well, they all have a, been, a big impact on transport, or I mean on uh, agriculture, as I mentioned before. But uh, when you look at transportation, especially um, 
we often refer to that as the lifeline for rural communities. Um, you know, they don't have, uh, you know, commercial airlines coming out of there, so uh, especially for agriculture, you're going to need to uh, truck those products, whether it's uh, milo or wheat. You have to take them through the nearest market, so it's uh, very important um, for rural Kansas to have a quality road program. Uh, for a number of years, we were, uh, during the Sebelius administration, we were uh, ranked as having the second best highway system in the country. Uh, I don't think it's uh, dropped that much. Uh, obviously, I think the number of uh, projects that have been able to be secured has probably dropped a little bit. As far as water, uh, you know, we sit on, or at least Northwest Kansas sits on the Ogallala Aquifer. So uh, an education program has started, uh, uh, teaching farmers to look at alternative crops that are less uh, water, uh, re have less water requirements. And then, uh, the, you know, the whole infrastructure thing is we need to keep on top of that with all our state uh, institutions and so forth and make sure that uh, they stay in, uh, in uh, you know, excellent operating order. Uh, because a lot of money has been invested in that, so uh, we don't want to see that lost. And then renewable energy, we're seeing, uh, you know, the wind farms and, and solar energy really increasing in our state. This question comes from a member of the community. With continued drought conditions in western Kansas, irrigation can be important for the cultivation of crops. For example, growing corn requires a lot of water. But where is the tipping point? At what point does the need to lower water consumption levels surpass the importance of raising crops? Mr. Phelps? Or, um, uh, you know, we always talk about uh, how important water is to western Kansas. Uh, we've done our share uh, towards that effort of conserving here in Hayes. Started back years ago when I was on the city commission, we developed a conservation program for our community and also uh, secured long-term water sources. In the meantime, you know, each governor has had a, a governor's water program and they've uh, conducted programs all over the state in, you know, trying to educate farmers on, like, as I mentioned before, alternative crops. One of the alternative crops that's come up here in recent years is uh, industrial hemp. And so we have a chicken before the egg thing here where uh, the uh, processors don't want to move here until they know farmers are going to grow the crop. Farmers don't want to go to the crop unless they have the, uh, you know, the means to get it processed. So one of the things we can do is alleviate any restrictions going from border to border uh, where they have to take those product, products out of state. But I think more and more farmers are looking at alternative crops, knowing full well that that Ogallala Aquifer is not a renewable uh, water source. It's depleting. It used to be in our area, and it's shrunk way up into northwest Kansas. So it's inevitable that uh, droughts are going to be part of the cycle and we can't move forward, you know, with crops that are water intensive. So I think we're seeing an education program going on by our Department of Agriculture and letting people know. As I mentioned, uh, wheat strains uh, are developing that are more efficient. Representative Wassinger. You know, there's an, an amazing program called ALIMA, Limited uh, water usage of the people that, of the farmers in the northwest part of Kansas, they've seen their water table go up because they have voluntarily limited how much they use irrigation. And they've adapted to using a little bit less water every day. And, and it's just a matter, that for that, it's a matter of conservation. If you ever have a chance to hear them talk about it, it's, it's an amazing story. It's, it's so important that we realize that, true, it, a, a drought will happen, um, but we all have to, to try to conserve water the best way we can and plant the right crops. Bryce Custer is a farmer uh, up here in Trigo County. He does cro cover crops. He's taking care of uh, uh, ground erosion, uh, Farm ground is not washing away. His fields are almost too rich. So there's so many ideas out there and so many wonderful uh, Kansans that are willing to try them and willing to speak out and tell everyone that. Thank you. 
The next question, what are the biggest challenges facing public education in Kansas, and how would you address those challenges? We'll start with Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. Well, if I could answer that and tell you exactly how to fix everything, then I would probably be a, a pretty wealthy woman. Uh, I, think, I think the biggest challenge we have is that we give millions of dollars to education funding without asking for any kind of accountability. And it's not going to the classrooms. It's not going to teacher salaries. If you go and look at the teacher salaries list for USD 489, there are a lot of people that are teachers that aren't really making a wage that they can live on, particularly if they live by themselves. So I think what I voted for was accountability in K through 12 funding. There, the my office mate who was a, a principal and the other people on the education committee that were teachers came up with some great ideas and it was voted down by the governor and, and I, I think it's really important that we need to have some accountability within education so that we do see better grades and better, better outcomes. Thank you. Mr. Phelps? Well, one of the things that I talked about earlier, of course, was uh, funding of education. When you look at the Kansas Constitution, there's only one thing that we are required to do as a legislature, a legislative body, and that is to fund K-12 education at adequate funding levels. We've uh, been doing that for many years, and when people talk about there's no accountability, I scoff at that because it's absolutely not true. What do you gotta look at when you put money into something is what is your return on your investment? And all you have to do is go back and look over the years where our students performed compared to the national averages. We're way above the national average, even now with uh, the cuts that have taken place in the last few years. Uh, we still have the very high NAEP reading scores for our kids in uh, the lower elementary grades. Our SAT and ACT scores are way above the national average. Our graduation rates are above national average. Our truancy is lower than the national average. So there's accountability there. And it's a direct correlation of funding. And anybody that understands education funding and outcomes will tell you there's a direct correlation between how much money you put in and what you get out. People talk about it being 65% of the, of the budget and so forth, and they act as though that's a bad thing. Investing in kids, our future, is, is to me, is, is the best investment we can have. And that's the best return on our investment, and I'll never apologize for that. Thank you. Many speculate that if current U.S. Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed, there may be an opportunity to overturn or significantly limit the decision of Roe versus Wade. However, according to a 2019 Pew Research poll, 7 in 10 Americans do not believe that the law should be completely overturned. Would you support legislation that severely limits or prohibits abortion in the state of Kansas? Mr. Phelps, um, you go first. Okay. Uh, during my uh, years in the legislature, I always had a pro-life voting record. Uh, in the meantime, though, I, I, I take that beyond... Uh, just birth. I think if you're truly, you know, pro-life and respectful of life, you're going to look at all those funding issues that uh, go beyond the birth of a child. That's supporting early childhood development issues and all the screenings that go with that. So we can do preventive medicine, if you will, and prevent problems in the future. We also need to take care of our elderly. As mentioned before, put more money into to, uh, our mental health um, uh, 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 providers throughout the state. I uh, recently met with the folks from uh, uh, High Plains Mental Health and of course they you know, have uh, some funding issues and, and backlogs and so forth. But my point is we got to look at everything when we're talking about uh, the life issue. And so I, I, as I mentioned, had a pro-life voting record but it continues on with uh, voting for children, voting for their education, voting for their post-secondary education, and voting for the elderly, and I will continue to do that. Representative Wassinger, this is a reminder that you have 90 seconds. Okay. Um, I, I have been endorsed by the Kansans for life. I am a strong supporter 
of, of life and have, have voted as such. Last year, year before, the Kansas Supreme Court eliminated any kind of, of restrictions on abortion clinics, which was bad for women. What we need, what we tried to do is pass the Value Them Both Amendment, which allowed for licensing and in inspections of abortion clinics so that women would be safe, they would be, they would be taken care of. I believe we need to take care of the child and we need to keep, take care of the woman herself. There, I will not vote for funding for taxpayer um, abortions, pay, taxpayers paying for abortions. It's, it's just part of who I am. So I, I, I can't begin to speculate on, on the uh, federal level, but I know in the state level that I've been a strong supporter of life. Thank you. This next question comes from a member of the community um, and a couple of comments with it. Uh, first of all, they wanted to thank both of you for your many years of service to the community and the entire state of Kansas. Their question relates to higher education. Would you please comment on why you support state funding for higher education in, in Kansas? And please comment on your understanding of the importance of state funding for higher education in terms of supporting business, industry, and nonprofits throughout Kansas. <laughs> Sorry, we will start with Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. I think we, I think I kind of answered that before that I've been a strong supporter of Fort Hayes and I enjoy being on the higher education budget where I can see that we're putting the money and investing in tech schools. It is, it is crazy when you think how, how shorthanded we are with, with tech um, graduates to do plumbing, electrical, all of those things. So it's all very important. And I, I realize the importance of funding for that. And we just need to keep it up and, and really look at it and see what, where is the money best spent. All right. Thank you. Mr. Phelps, you have 90 seconds. Well, I'd repeat a couple of my comments from earlier, and that is um, that's uh, one of our best uh, investments um, as far as return on investments is education at all levels. The importance of Fort Hayes State University and all the higher ed uh, opportunities in Hayes, such as uh, North Central Kansas Technical College with their Hayes campus, as well as um, uh, the um, cosmetology school that we have here, those all add to this community. They add to our economic development. Uh, the instructors, the people that run that school, the administration and so forth, those all are people that are paid and that money is returned to the community uh, as they buy homes and so forth. Uh, we're also looking at higher education, though, in answering the call to uh, industry and providing educated uh, an educated workforce. Uh, one of the great things that I got involved in a number of years ago was when we developed the uh, Technical Education Commission, which then formed the Technical Education Authority, which is under the Board of Regents. And uh, what, th what happened there was uh, the schools were gone and doing their own thing. They weren't listening to industry. We got them together, and industry started telling them what they needed, and the schools responded. That's why their enrollments have been high, their outcomes have been great, and we've provided great uh, workers for uh, big companies like Boeing, as well as small uh, mom-and-pop businesses right here in Hayes. Thank you. In a major public health crisis like the current COVID-19 pandemic, who should have the authority to take emergency actions? Is it the legislature or the governor, and why? Mr. Phelps, the question goes to you. This is a reminder that you have, a nine, or that you have 90 seconds. Well, one of the things I'd like to see uh, return to this state is uh, when I first went to the legislature, and that was that uh, working, um, uh, that working together that we had and the camaraderie and so forth, and so as we uh, look at a situation like who should have the authority, the governor or the legislature, I'm all in favor of the two working together. Now, the governor is going to listen to medical science, and she's going to follow their lead. We need a legislative body that's going to treat this as a medical issue and not go through this whole thing again of treating it as an economic or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a political issue. It's a health issue. 
And those that are willing to listen to the people that tell us how to keep safe, instead of waiting until it's out of control, that's, that's going to be how we get things done. And if that's the governor making that call or the legislature, I'm all for it. I just assume they both work together. Because if you have one pushing back, there's delays. In the meantime, we have people getting sick and we have people dying. I personally, in everything I've read and talked to uh, physicians, uh, I think everybody agrees that we need to keep doing the things we're doing as far as masks and social distancing, but I also believe that uh, the worst is yet to come. Representative Wassinger. Well, it, the governor and the legislature are working together to make sure that everything um, is safe. There's the State Finance Council who also provides a check, check and balance to the governor, and that's what's been going on. There's been no partisanship. Uh, it is, it is re it's frankly astounding to not think of it as also an economic issue. It, it is. Our state is suffering. Uh, we have so much unemployment within the state. I've talked to these people on the phone. I've, I've heard their, their pleas for help. I've heard them want to get back to work. But we, we need to go back to local control. We have wonderful state, uh, county health departments that are taking care of their people. We're the commissioners, the county commissioners, the city commissioners, all throughout Kansas are trying to do the best job they can to keep Kansans safe, and they will continue to do that. We can't just, we have to have a check, check and balance within, within the legislature and the governor's office so that we all are doing the best for Kansans. Thank you. What is your position on Medicaid expansion in Kansas? And this first goes to Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. Uh, there really needs to be some important additions to Medicaid expansion. Uh, I'm, I'm watching you talk and I'm, I should not do that. Uh, that need to be seen in any kind of bill for Medicaid expansion. We need to have people have some skin in the game and have them pay a premium according to their income base. We also need to have some sort of pathway to work and we need to provide for improved can care reimbursements. We have a, a disabled uh, community that's waiting in line for services, and they will be stepped over by adding Medicaid expansion. So we need to make sure that we increase can care reimbursements, get those, those, uh, get those waiting lists cleaned up so that our most vulnerable people in Kansas are not sit, sitting and waiting. Question now goes to you, Mr. Phelps. Well, I've had the opportunity to vote in favor of Medicaid expansion uh, uh, at least three different times uh, during my tenure in the legislature. And when we look back, if we would have adopted uh, uh, Medicaid expansion way back when, uh, when we had an opportunity to do so, we would be so much further ahead budget-wise here in this state. If you go to the Kansas uh, Department or Kansas uh, Hospital Association website, uh, you can uh, find a ticker that they have there that indicates uh, the latest reading that I've seen is about 4.7 billion dollars is what we've passed up on in this state. Which, if we would have done that, we'd have that money coming in. And which, by the way, is, is just under a, a million dollars a year for Hayes Medical. And uh, think what that would do for our community if they had those resources added to what they, you know, what their current budget is. So we have a, an opportunity here, again, that we have a governor that's not going to veto uh, a, a Medicaid expansion bill. Yes, there's a matching fund, which right now is 90% from the federal government. In that bill, if it goes below that, the state can pull out of it. 39 states have either adopted Medicaid expansion or are in the process. Right now, we're an island between the four states around us that uh, they've already had Medicaid expansion passed by their legislators. And so here we are, Kansas, letting all this money pass by and letting 150,000 people go uninsured. Thank you. Artie, this question is from a community audience member. This question comes from Facebook. College students often feel underrepresented in the Kansas legislature. Why should a college student vote for you? Mr. Phelps, you may go first. Remember that you have 90 seconds. Okay. 
Well, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this program one of the reasons why I decided to go back in the legislature. And I look back on um, February 9th, 2019, uh, when in the middle of the afternoon my phone started beeping one after another. And when I looked at it, there was um, uh, two Republicans, two Democrats, and a member of the audience representing one of the universities all told me in, other, in so many words that they were just disbelief that our current legislator voted in opposition to a bill that would add additional money for the region's institutions in the state of Kansas. The prior session when I was there, we had uh, uh, passed, uh, I think, an $18 million little package for, uh, to make up for some lost money for the, uh, the regions. In that legislative, in the 2019 session, uh, there was an amendment to add more money, and I couldn't, I, I didn't have an answer for people when they asked why our current legislator voted in opposition to that, because I mentioned uh, what's good for Fort Hayes is good for this community, and I think that uh, we need to fund Fort Hayes as uh, every need they have because that is a, our biggest, one of our biggest employers in this region, and it also is, is a major part in developing that workforce that I've been talking about, and uh, we need that education, we need that funding. Representative Wassinger. I, I'm very excited to talk to college students and Fort Hayes students, and, I, and, and I'm a little disheartened by a lot of them are not all that interested in the legislature, and I think this something like this really helps the student government, political science, students that are interested and, and want to be a part of it. It is, the, the one thing I have been is ac accountable to everyone. I, as I go door to door, which I go to the door, I leave my, my, my literature in the door, and a note that says, here's my phone number, here's my email. I'm not knocking on the door, but I ring the bell and I stand on the sidewalk. And when I talk to all these people, what they're most concerned about right now are jobs in the economy, they're worried about term limits. They don't like to have the same people in, in office as long as 18 years, as some people that I know. We need, we need to be looking at all of that and we need to have more active college students get, get involved in understanding what's going on. And I thank you for having this because I think it's a big help. Thank you. Uh, what kinds of policies, if any, would you support to promote social and racial justice in our community? We'll start with Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. When I go to different doors and they uh, so many times these people say, people say to me, why are, are, why are the politicians all so cruel and unkind and, and, and angry fighting with one another? And I, I tell them that I believe that the biggest problem is the devaluation of human life. We don't appreciate seniors. We don't, we don't protect our unborn. We don't protect... Now you can, we have uh, politicians that want to be able to abort a child after it's born, living child after it's born, we have to go back to appreciating human life and appreciating one another and not be so angry. And I think when you don't appreciate human life as seniors or as the unborn, you don't appreci appreciate people. And I think that's a huge problem. And I think that's the, the major issue which I'm trying to make sure gets fixed. Thank you. Mr. Phelps? Well, racial and, and, and social justice um, uh, can be addressed at all different levels, uh, but one of the uh, best places to start that is in, in our K-12 system, making sure that we have the best quality teachers in place. Uh, we can find out their views through the interview and vetting process, but at the same time, uh, we need to have those teachers in the schools really in the administrations having a zero tolerance. And, uh, you know, we have uh, things in place in the business world as far as, you know, hiring people uh, where you, you know, can't uh, refuse employment to somebody because of their skin color or their gender. And subsequently, in our school system, um, I had a, I talked to a teacher that was a 40-year classroom teacher, and one of the things they focus on is watching out for bullying 
uh, both by the students doing the bullying and those that are being bullied. So that's an area where they're trying to, uh, uh, you know, stop, uh, you know, permanent scarring of an individual. And so they can be looking at that too from the, uh, uh, you know, from the racial issue as well. And so I think that a zero tolerance uh, uh, by teachers, the way they behave and what they say on Facebook and so forth, needs to really be enforced so that there's a great example set for the kids as they're growing up, especially during those formative years where uh, they'll pick up on that. Uh, I had a social studies teacher here tell me that a uh, student said that some uh, presidential candidate uh, didn't believe in God. Thank you. In Kansas, the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Missouri, Nebraska, and Colorado all have higher minimum wages than Kansas, according to the U.S. Department of Labor. With those states having higher rates than Kansas and the costs of living increasing significantly since the federal, the last federal increase, do you believe that there should be legislation on the state level to raise the pay? Mr. Phelps, you go first. Remember that there is 90 seconds in your response. Uh, well, there's been uh, attempts in previous uh, legislative sessions to raise the minimum wage in Kansas. But what we've uh, developed into um, pretty much all over the country is we have what we call a uh, people that are working poor. Uh, I, uh, in, in door to door uh, conversation just yesterday, uh, talked to a single mother uh, that actually had three jobs. And uh, one of them was she was self employed. But the fact of the matter is, she was working. Uh, to take care of her kids and the home that she had purchased and, um, you know, making do, but still, uh, you know, having a lot of needs that weren't being met. So the fact of the matter is, if we don't uh, increase the uh, minimum wage, that trend is going to continue. So as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, we need to revisit our tax code so we can take care of people that are at the lower, lower end of the income scale. In addition to that, we have the highest sales tax on, uh, on groceries in the country. And uh, that is something that we've tried to reduce in the state of Kansas for years. And that's gonna help out those, uh, you know, things like that added to maybe adding a little bit to the minimum wage is gonna help people in those lower income brackets. Representative Wassinger. There were at least three bills that the governor vetoed in my first two years in, in the legislature to lower food sales tax, different ideas on how to do it. So having that be one of her campaign promises and something that has been worked on before, I, I don't see how it didn't, especially these last two years. It is very hard to um, decide what is the right minimum wage. We lose workers with with certification issues on the, our border states. So we need to work on that. Perhaps we do need to raise minimum wage to make sure that we don't lose the people, particularly around the borders of Kansas, to stay within Kansas and keep working. We, have, we need this workforce. But if we don't get back to work, we may not. But it's, it's, it's certainly something to look into. Thank you. Uh, we will go to a couple of audience questions. This one comes from Facebook. What would be the first thing you would try to accomplish in the legislature that could not be accomplished before? We'll start with Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. My, my first goal is to help fix the, the uh, foster care system in Kansas. I think it's a sin that we've let kids sleep on sofas. We've lost children prior to this. Uh, we need to make sure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable citizens. And these kids, for them to be moved from house to house to house, when we have, just here in Ellis County, we have a church that has a ministry for, for foster care. I met with Laura Howard two or three times saying, we have got to make it easier for people to become licensed foster care parents so we can take care of those children. That is one of my biggest goals in this next two years. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. I believe in my heart that uh, one of the first things the legislature needs to do when they convene in January is not mess around for two weeks uh, doing nothing, 
but I think uh, immediately they need to take that Medicaid expansion bill and get it out of the committee, get it on floor, and either the, you can start it in the House or the Senate. You need to get that passed, get that out of the way. In my opinion, if that doesn't happen right away, then the people that vote against it or don't think it's a good idea, they need to start uh, coming up with their ideas where they want to cut funds. If they go after education, they're going to be in, pro in trouble because it, uh, you know, we, get, we settled the Gannon versus State of Kansas lawsuit, and before that, we uh, you know, solved the Montoy, uh, Montoy versus State of Kansas. So we don't want to go down that road again. We want to get this Medicaid expansion uh, passed because the money's not going to come in the next day, but it'll at least give us something to look forward to in the future. And then in the meantime, we need to, I think, do a total tax uh, review. But my first priority would be to push for passing Medicaid expansion and then get on to the issues of the budget when we start seeing where the revenues are that are coming in. Thank you. We'll do one more audience question. This question comes from a business owner. Please comment on the current concerns with the fraudulent unemployment claims at the Kansas Department of Labor. What can be done in the legislature to address this issue? We'll start with Mr. Phelps first. Well, within the legislature, we have the uh, uh, legislative post audit, and uh, I'm certain that a, uh, a legislative oversight committee could be put together and making sure, because that's what had to happen in, in foster care. Needed to be more oversight to find out why we had 70 children go missing here a few years ago. But in the meantime, with uh, the fraudulent claims, uh, I believe that's being addressed, but it's probably happening at a level that maybe isn't uh, happening as quick as some people would like to see it. But I think an oversight committee can review that and find out what steps or what, at least what legislative tools the uh, legislature can provide uh, for the oversight and also uh, do a post audit and find out if it is a legitimate uh, claim. And uh, maybe they're on top of things, maybe they're not. I haven't heard that much about it, but I think that it can be solved very easily. Thank you, Representative Wassinger. I called the Department of Labor many times during the first two weeks of being back from session this year to deal with fraudulent claims. Uh, I talked to people uh, within businesses in town that know of fraudulent claims that we're going through. And the Department of Labor had a very difficult time this first two years. The secretary was in way over her head. She has since been replaced by a different secretary, and I think they're really working on trying to make sure that we don't have fraudulent claims being paid and we're making sure we're taking care of people. The state of Kansas did the worst job in getting unemployment checks out. I, I talked to so many people, and, and we just need to make sure that we keep an eye on that. And, and I think the squeaky wheel kind of gets the grease. I keep calling, and I keep asking them for things, and they will give us information, and the audit will show that. Thank you. We'll wrap up with one last question. It's about voting in the election um, in November. Uh, President Trump has called into question the security of voting by mail, alleging that it creates potential for voter fraud, even though studies have not shown evidence of widespread voter fraud with this method of voting. Should residents in the 111th district be worried about their vote not being secure? Why or why not? And we'll start with you, Representative Wassinger. You have 90 seconds. I think that the, uh, our cl county clerk has done an excellent job of trying to make sure that every vote is taken care of. There's a whole lot of um, uh, problems that uh, we saw a couple of years ago. We've got new voting machines. I think everyone needs to do the what makes them most comfortable. If they're afraid to go in and vote, then they should probably get an advanced ballot and vote early by mail. I know that uh, Clerk Maskus is working very hard. She's got a box out for people to put things in so they don't have to put it in the mail. If they're worried about the mail, they can drop it in the ballot box outside that's locked. I think, I think what we need to do, for me, I want to go in and vote. That's how I always have since I was 18. So I, I, would, I would just make sure that everyone do what makes them the most comfortable and they're, so that they're not afraid to vote. Thank you. Mr. Phelps? I would um, kind of look at uh, some examples. You know, one thing legislators always do is they, they're even doing this on Medicaid expansion. They want to see how it's working out in other states. 
And so when we get to the mail ballot, you know, they wanted to do that on the state level and just have everybody vote by mail. The pandemic obviously has spurred that along where a lot of people are, you know, asking or requesting a mail ballot. In fact, here in Ellis County, I think uh, three weeks ago, there was an article in the paper where there had already been 3,500 people ask for a, a ballot uh, by mail. And I think that's probably growing, probably just uh, maybe around 4,000, or at least it will be by the deadline. So when we look at examples, Colorado has been doing mail voting for 30 years and had no problem. The military has been doing it for years. How do you think people from overseas vote? You know, uh, they mail in their ballot. So uh, uh, questioning mail ballots and questioning the Postal Service, I think, is, um, is not really a legitimate claim. And as I mentioned, we want to keep people safe. We want to do social distancing. And if a lot of people, um, you know, are, uh, uh, you know, uneasy about going out and uh, still going out in public, uh, why not? So uh, we do have the ability to do mail ballots, and I can't, I can't see any reason why that wouldn't be successful. I've requested a mail ballot, and I know many of my friends have, and so I'm looking forward to those being sent out here in a week or so and uh, I'll be voting by mail. Thank you. Now we will move on to closing statements. Mr. Phelps will go first. You have two minutes. Once again, thank you and uh, really good questions. I really appreciate those coming in. Uh, as we move now to the last, uh, I believe, 28 days before the election, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, I've been going door to door, getting into some great uh, discussions with people, and I will continue to do that, uh, you know, until the uh, election day. I want to emphasize a couple things that, um, you know, I mentioned during the, uh, the program here, and that is my support for uh, education at all levels. I can't say it enough that that is a, a, one of our best expenditures. And obviously K-12 is uh, part of our Constitution. And so a lot of people are always talking about their rights being taken away, that they got to wear a mask or so forth. Uh, I look at them and say, well, wh where are you at on, on uh, K-12 funding? What do you think that is? That is a right by every child in our state to receive an education by our state. And it has so many positive things coming out by funding at the uh, correct levels. That being uh, job creation or, you know, a workforce that goes into the job market and they're educated and they're qualified and they have great skill sets, and in, especially those that have gone through our uh, technical education programs. Uh, is mentioned by my opponent about winners and losers on, on uh, COVID. Uh, once again, I don't look at that as any kind of a winner loser economically or politically. I look at that as a health issue. And so the people that are losing are people that have lost their lives and their families have lost a loved one. And I don't want that riding on my shoulder. Uh, it's mentioned about going to local control. I'm very thankful to our Hayes City Commission who followed the governor's lead, followed Dr. Uh, uh, Lee Norman's lead, as well as Dr. Fauci, and they once again renewed the uh, mask mandate here in the, in the city of Hayes. And I think another other, uh, number of other communities have followed suit, and you can see where their numbers are, uh, where they've dropped significantly and ours have gone up. Thank you. Representative Wassinger, you have two minutes to make your closing statement. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here t tonight and to, to uh, do the best of, of hearing from our, our, uh, our community through Facebook. And I hope everyone has um, paid close attention. It's, it's very unfair to say that I don't support schools or higher education. There's so much more information that you, you need to know that it's important to me that I have four children. I've, why would I not be pro-education? I am pro-teachers, I'm pro-classrooms. I think all of that should be taken into account. I stand up for the, the citizens of, of Kansas as well as Ellis County. I've tried to, to lower their regulations, their taxes. I've tried to make sure that we can support our farmers, we can support human life, and we can we can take care of the budget. I voted against the 2021 budget because Kansas is still overspending every single day. And you can hide that with numbers. You can pull money from my one account into another to make it sh the, the balanced budget. It's, we have got to get ourselves under control. You as a, as a homeowner or a taxpayer, 
you, you watch your budget. You don't spend more than you bring in. Maybe you do, maybe you're in credit card debt, but we can't, we can't do that. We can't continue to do that as a state. It takes thoughtful concern for everyone in, in Kansas to, to do the right thing. And that's what I plan to do. And I look forward to being your representative for the next two years. Thank you. For more information about the 2020 election, take a look at the 2020 election guide created by the Forsyth Library at fhsuguides.fhsu.edu forward slash 2020 election. If you aren't registered to vote, you can do so through tomorrow, October 13th. Early voting begins Monday, October 19th. Contact the Ellis County Clerk for more information. That concludes our debate this evening. Thank you to the candidates for participating and to all of you for watching. Good night.